Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here today at MOCA. I am Amanda Hunt, the Director of Education and Public Programs. And I'm thrilled to invite to the podium uh, Robin Cost Lewis, who is the new Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. A native of Compton, Lewis is the author of the 2015 National Book Award winning collection of poems. We live? Okay, there we go. Hello, we're back. Thank you for sticking with us. To begin again, a native of Compton, Lewis is the author of the 2015 National Book Award winning collection of poems, Voyage of the Sable Venus. She is a writer in residence and provost fellow at the University of Southern California, a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and the California Book Award, and she has published poems in The New Yorker, The Best American Poetry, Lambda Literary Review, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and Wide Awake, Poets of Los Angeles and Beyond. Above all, Lewis is a brilliant speaker and mind. I'm so honored to have her here with us today in the presence of Carrie James Marshall's works. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello, everyone. How many of you all are seeing the Carrie James Marshall exhibit for the first time? You guys are lucky. Isn't it amazing? It's extraordinary to have it here in Los Angeles. Um, this is my third, it was like my 10th time seeing it, but this is like my third time seeing it. I saw all the other stops, uh, New York and Chicago. Um, it's really special to have this exhibit in LA um, for many people, um, but especially for artists who are from LA and left. That would be me. I'm admitting my tre treacherous traitordom. Um, uh, but the reason why I left is, as Amanda said, I was born in Compton, and a lot of black artists uh, left the West Coast to go to the East Coast for training, for uh, discourse, for rigor, and, uh, and then a lot did not. And so people like Wanda Coleman, Octavia Butler, Mark Bradford, Noah Davis, Carrie James Marshall, I mean, he eventually did leave, but he spent a lot of time here. And um, so I hope you've had a chance, those of you who know, who, La who know Los Angeles very well, to walk around and see some of our really important landmarks in history um, valiantly represented in his work. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for coming. I'm going to read some poems. Uh, I thought, however, it's kind of like false advertising. Um, I was going to read poems from uh, work from my title poem, which is Voyage of the Sable Venus, which is about uh, the Western art historical construct of the black female body ov over millennia, um, but I don't want to. <laughs> I thought I'd read some other poems. I've been thinking a lot about uh, Emily Dickinson's kind of uh, Ars Poetica or her manifesto, manifesto to tell its slant, and I try a lot to talk about uh, issues uh, in ways that, uh, I guess to be blunt, are, are sneaky um, and gentle. Uh, gentleness as a weapon, someone said, a, a critic said of my work once. I, I guess that's true. Uh, and so I thought I'd read some other poems. They completely engage, I, I hope it's not too presumptuous of me to say that my project and Marshall's project are in conversation with each other in a lot of ways. Um, I am by no means a master, and he definitely is. Um, but uh, I am very much inspired by his work, and I have been for decades. And so I think I'm going to read some poems about those issues as opposed to uh, poems from the title sequence. So the first poem I'm going to read is titled Felicité. Uh, for those of you guys who don't speak French, Felicité means happiness. Um, but before I begin, I want to thank Mocha. I especially want to thank the uber magnificent Helen Molesworth curator. Thank you, Amanda. Uber curator, uber genius. Very one of those SBD, silent but deadly women in the world. <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. Um, and Mocha in general. 
And also thanks to the crew, you guys. You're amazing. That was quick. I got here like 15 minutes ago. They were like, bada bing, bada bam. It was set up. I was like, okay. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Felicite. Of all 300 species of hummingbirds, only one, the ruby-throated, crossed the Mississippi. Somehow this matters to me. They can hover in midair. They can fly backwards. They fly 500 miles straight through across the Gulf of Mexico without ever landing. Their mouths are hollow burnished needles, bright sharp flutes. They sip the nectar of cactus flowers. When Louisiana meant all the land from the Pacific to the Mississippi, a grandmother of mine once owned one of the largest plantations in the territory. When Louisiana meant Spain, she had been a slave. When Spain sold itself back, she's listed as the sole owner of a vast plantation, a plantation so large many property lines now form the boundaries of an entire county. Tonight, after 25 years, I realize I've spent my entire life avoiding any situation that might require me to say these words aloud. From that moment, I discovered her rotting inside a molding courthouse, her signature next to the plantation's inventory. I began to babble any words I can think of in four different languages, placing them in the most chaotic order possible in order not to say these words. The black side of my family owned slaves or her signature, Marie Pani, Femme de Color Libre, Marie Panis, Free Woman of Color. Her lover was a famous judge from Sardinia. He took great pleasure in watching black women hanged inside the square to musical accompaniment. I read this about him once, then tried to see her brown, sleeping next to him, fucking him on her plantation on top of a pineapple bed, kissing behind his ears, sharing an alligator pear, strolling through her cane. Maybe at some point every hour, a part of me has wondered about her silently, though I do not think so, I'm sorry, though I did not think so until just now. Perhaps she is the answer to the sensation I've had for years, that of another body hovering inside me, waiting for a dress. What can history possibly say? Sometimes I feel a pride I cannot defend or explain. Sometimes I smile. Into the barbed nectar of this story I have stared my whole life. Whenever someone tried to kiss me, I tucked her name under my tongue. If someone tried too long to hold me, I hid her between my legs. If they wanted to touch me there, I'd pull out her name and place the white bone under my pillow, hoping she would return, take it away, leave me a glistening quarter. To her son, Théodore, Marie Pani gave her favorite slave, a girl named Félicité. They were married. One of her children, Héloise, was my grandmother's great-great-grandmother. There is a picture I found of Héloise once corseted in a studio, standing next to a waist-length pillar which held a verdant fern. But mostly I have wondered, how does one name a slave happiness? Happiness had a twin sister, Francoise. I don't know what happened to her. Perhaps she is still out there, like us, her throat glistening, a silent red. Or perhaps she is the only one who can still cross the river, the one who is still flying backwards over the gulf without landing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was, uh, as Amanda said, I was recently honored with uh, being named the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. I am in shock still. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I recently attended the National uh, Day of Prayer with Mayor Garcetti and the First Lady of Los Angeles. And uh, 
it was an interdenominational event and there were clergy and priests and nuns and lay people and secular socialists and it was fantastic. And I was really shocked. I went to divinity school. In another life, I was a theologian. And I was really so very moved by the commitment that the city has to completely eradicating homelessness, not just trying to help homeless people who are homeless, but completely eradicating it complete, uh, uh, all together and building public housing. And it just reminded me yet again why I'm so very proud to be uh, a native Angelino. Um, but my parents were not native Angelinos. They were part of the Great Migration. And uh, they came from Louisiana, as so many people did. When I was growing up, one out of three black people were from Louisiana. It was a blast, y'all. It was great. <laughs> you, there was so much good food in this city, you have no idea. The 60s were fantastic. Um, so in any case, uh, my father was a World War II veteran, and he met my mom in a Louisiana fish market here when he was visiting after the war uh, looking for a date. And he never left. They were married 53 years. I know. So I thought I'd read Second Line for my dad because as I told Helen uh, Molesworth, who's a curator of this exhibit once, we were having dinner upstairs and it's so weird to sit architecturally in a space that did not exist before. And I was saying, Helen, you don't understand. Like, this was not here. This space for Kerry James Marshall's work did not exist, um, literally and figuratively. Right? It's a very strange thing, you guys, if you grow up in a place that does not see the history of your art in any way, and then suddenly there's this incredible celebration, not without a fight. There's an incredible celebration. So I thought I'd read a poem about my dad called Second Line. And then one day you fell and broke your neck just like that while taking a shower. Afterward, you walked back to your chair and asked about the length and color of the weather lady's hair. It was brown. When the ambulance arrived, you told them, go on home, you were fine. Two hours later, you slumped over, and still it took them three more days to realize you had severed your spine, because the whole time you told jokes and wouldn't quit smiling. Pull my finger. Stoic and stolen so early on, what is it about veterans of the Second World War that makes death require more convincing? Three months in ICU, a broken neck, three bouts of pneumonia, eight heart attacks, a clement stream of steady infections, and yet there you were, still, 84, in a coma, batting your eyelashes nonstop and full speed at the world. Even while dying, you would not die, so we were forced to kill you. But then we put on Ray Charles, and just when they pulled the plug, he began your favorite song, Hit the Road, Jack which you did, you hit it. Before the song could end, you were gone. I've never been so proud as I was that morning watching your breath second, loan, second line home so quietly. Except for that day when I first started my period and was ashamed. Nobody could go and buy me anything because they said it all came with the new messy territory. But you drove me right up to the store, said stay in the car then came back out with a paper bag. When you fell, it was the first month of spring, March 13th. That day, I climbed up into the air and could not climb back down until just now. So, how do you call that body born colored and male, hunted and used for cog and prey, tree adornment, altar cloth, war fodder, and still somehow came laughter, often and more eagerly than fear. Your one half good eye forever fixed and cocked on the wry glint of the world. When I was four, you showed me how to play tonk and the proper way to throw down a bone and score with sound. When kindergarten began, they had to skip me two grades because you'd already taught me when and how to double down. That's what it felt like to be Negro me, daughter of colored janitor you. Pi, the mathematical number, pi was not a pastry. 
History was not a book. It was a smell like damp cinnamon in your blue work shirt. Starched pans, union, crawdad, crab boil, oysters shucked and soaking in their primordial liqueur. It smelled like all of this in the vieux carré, its thick peculiar cotton air breaking beneath the sea's sloppy canopy. It smelled like the last high note of the market woman's song sing song whenever she cried fresh strawberries. History was the smell of dirty white soaking in a hot tub of bleach and your first whore, that nice girl from Storyville who Anc Felix took you to see when you were a randy gentleman all of 14. History was the morning of your first communion, marbles and cigarettes pocketed inside your muslin altar boy gown. It was the smell of gunpowder from the small pistol you hid in your sock to protect your brother Lucian and other Negro doctor friends while they tended the colored, sick, and shut-in. It smelled like a palmetto tree, like every tree, red with sap, warm with wonder, and holy things which are common and plain, a brown paper bag, okra by the crate, the ironing board when left in a room to cool. My pencil you sharpened with your switchblade each morning just before I left for school. I sensed all these things all over you. The countries you'd seen, but I had never been. I could smell the world. You gave it to me, Daddy. A fresh, sharp walnut, pungent and coy. You cracked it, plucked out its intelligence, then dropped it in my hand this deep black joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll read a fun poem. Um, none of my poems are fun, but they, they try. I'll tell a whole story about it, being commissioned to write a Valentine's poem that felt mus miserably. Um, but let's see. Uh, more great migration stories in honor of Carrie James Marshall. Uh, uh, when, um, so when I was growing up here, every summer, families went back to Louisiana to, uh, you know, see their families, the reason why families go home. We did that. And uh, what was really cool about that is children, as children all over the world for millennia have done, would bring and carry their own cultural artifacts, often in the form of language and games and songs, right? We all remember all of our nursery rhymes. One of our languages that came back one summer was called dog talk. And, um, you know, it was a way of usurping adult power for sure. You know, we could talk to each other and our parents didn't know what we were saying. Um, recently, when I moved home, I'm 52, my sister's 57, she still speaks dog talk and she started speaking it to me and I just started laughing hysterically. Um, but I started thinking about the ways that children are arbiters of culture. You can go to Rome and see games that children carved into the temples, you know, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Um, and so I wrote this poem dog talk for growing up in Compton and for children. I will translate it later, you won't understand what I'm saying, but I'll translate it, dog talk. We be ba broke a bevery be a billa bo bo bo. Our bower ma bows ba broke the bim and ban a bopa them ba ba them for bore a bear a bore or bar a bur a bore sabid or bore for bood. A bans a burst ko bash tim bins na bam sabikri bits. We be ba bent a binglibish. A bit embraced a bit, the Benaba rebased a bit about the bus a bame to bime. I call the translation Dog Talk for Dummies. It's not in the book. So, Dog Talk for Dummies, what this poem says is We broke every syllable. Our mouths broke them and opened them for air or water or seed or food. Answers, questions, names, secrets. We bent English, embraced it, then erased it at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. The body in August. Because when I was a child, God would pull me up into her lap. Because when she pulled me up into her lap, she would read to me. Because the story she read most was the one I liked least. Because every day she'd open that thin green book and say, this is the story of your life because from beginning to end, there were only three pages. 
I believe in that road that is infinite and black and goes on blindly forever. I believe crocodiles swallow rocks to help them digest crab because up until the 20th century, people could still die from sensation. And because my hunger is so deep, I am ashamed to lift my head. Because memory, not gravity, pins us to this spinning. And when God first laid eyes on us, she went mad from envy. Because if the planet had a back door, we'd all still be there, waiting for the air to approve our entry. Because your eyes were the only time the peonies said yes to me. Because no matter how many times I died, I always woke up again happy. Then, last night, after I yelled at him for the first time, my new son dreamt we went walking inside the trees. When he came, when we came across a squirrel, he said I'd kicked it. Then the squirrel changed into a thin green book, which we read. Because when God became a small child, I pulled her up into my lap. Because when I pulled her into my lap to please her, I opened my blouse. Because her mouth is an impossibly pink place, a gaping raw cathedral which she opened, teeth to nipple, then clamped down. Thank you. Mother Church number three, King Kletso, Yellow House, Chaco Canyon, San Juan County, New Mexico, Anasazi Ruins, for Henri at two. You step down into the flat world and ask me to say it, to explain how our name can mean both ancestor and enemy. Your body begins in four directions. Here, one calendar takes 18 years. I am three. One day is an eyelash. Your body is a segment of prehistoric road, a buried stairwell with only the top stair obvious. We are alluvial, obsidian. Sometimes the ground swells with disappointment. Sometimes we know our mountains will be renamed after foreign saints. We sing 900-year-old hymns that instruct us in how to sit still for 49 years through a 50-year drought. We climb down through the hole anyway and agree to the arrangement. Um, this is summer. Thank you. This is summer. You guys know how you know something, but you don't want to admit to yourself that you know something? Summer. Last summer, two discreet young snakes left their skin on my small porch two mornings in a row. Being postmodern now, I pretended as if I did not see them nor understand what I knew to be circling inside me. Instead, every hour I told my son to stop with his incessant back chat. I peeled a banana and cursed God, his arrogance, his gall, to still expect our devotion after creating love and mosquitoes. I showed my son the papery dead skin so he would know too what it feels like when something shows up at your door twice, telling you what you already know. Thank you. So I'm going to reverse my order. I usually read this long poem last and this shorter poem, I mean this long poem penultimately and this poem I'm about to read last. But I want to tell you guys a story because it's funny. I got, so I got a commission by the Academy of American Poets this year to write a Valentine poem. And I was like, you guys, that is the stupidest thing ever. Like, did you read my work? I don't really write love poems. But they were like, come on, it's going to be beautiful, dude. I was like, all right. So I tried. I wrote it for two months. I sent it to them. And they were like, uh, yeah, no, thank you. I was like, I told you. So I started thinking about like, what's wrong with me. I never can write a love poem. And, um, and then I was reminded again of the first poem in my collection called Plantation. It is a love poem, <laughs> which is my point. It's my point. Um, OK. So I was going to call this poem at first Love American Style. For those of you guys out there who remember the love boat, um, ha ha, that's a joke. OK, whatever. Anyway, um, and, 
And so I'm going to read this poem first, uh, and we can talk about it during the Q&A if you guys want. And then I'm going to read a longer poem that I'm just going to go into. So you guys should just chill out for about 10 minutes, OK? And then we'll stop the reading and have Q&A. This is Plantation. <laughs> this is Plantation. And then one morning, we woke up embracing on the bare floor of a large cage. To keep you happy, I decorated the bars. Because you had never been hungry, I knew I could tell you the black side of my family owned slaves. I realized this is perhaps the one reason why I love you, because I told you this and you still wanted to kiss me. We laughed when I said, plantation. Fell into our chairs when I said, Cain. There were fingers on the floor and the split bodies of women who'd been torn apart by horses during the Inquisition. You'd said, well, I'll be damned. Every now and then, you change from a prancing black buck into a small, high yellow girl, pigtailed, patent leather, eyes spinning gossamer, begging for egg salad and banana pudding. Or just as quickly, you become the girl's mother, pulling yourself away from yourself. Because my whole head was covered with a heaving beehive, you thought I didn't notice. I noticed, I cried, honey. And then you were 14 and you had grown a glorious steel cock under your skirt. To brag, you rubbed yourself against me. Then your tongue was inside my mouth and I wanted to say, please ask me first, but it was your tongue. So who cared suddenly about your poor manners? We had books and a waterfall was falling in the corner. I didn't tell you I couldn't remember what that thing was you said to me once, that tender thing you'd said I should never forget. The moment you said it, I forgot it. I wondered if you thought we were lost. We weren't lost. We were lost. And meanwhile, all I could think about were the innumerable ways I would have loved to have eaten you. How being devoured can make one cry. And I hope you like the pleasant, pleasant, fresh taste of juiced cane. You pulled my pubic bone toward you. I didn't say it's still broken. I didn't tell you there's still this crack. It was sore, but I stayed silent because you were smiling. You said, the bars look pretty, baby. Then rubbed your hind legs up against me. Thank you. I'm going to close with a long poem so you guys can just chill out. Are there people standing up, do you guys want chairs? Maybe I can get you some chairs. Are you okay? You okay? Okay. This is on the road to Sri Bhuvaneshwari. What do you need to know? Sri Bhuvaneshwari is an honorific term for the goddess Parvati. Um, in India, Uttar Pradesh is a northern state in India where I lived for a while. And I think that's all you need to know. Okay on the road to Sri Bhuvaneshwari. Not much larger than a Volkswagen, smiling on the dashboard Gurumukh, marigolds so mild we can chew. What we call mountain, they say foothill. A whole vibrant green valley of terraced balconies, rectangular rice farms carved into every facade for seven centuries. Now and then, a clay road washed out by rain. We wait. Barefoot men in madras dhotis, bodies large only, uh, only large as necessity, hoist twice that in boulders, back up the mountain, back to that place where the road had been. Monsoon, Uttar Pradesh, 28 days of rain. At dinner, someone says, during the 19th century, all this water caused the British to go mad. They constantly committed suicide. Later, someone else points out the Victorian cemetery. I smile a little. That morning, seven langurs the size of six-year-olds, gray and brown, white and beige, tall tails curling, jumped up and down, shucked and jived on top of my cold tin roof. Somehow, I am still alive. I know it is wrong to think of a decade as lost. The more I recover, the more I go blind. Squat naked beside a steaming bucket, hold a small cloth, 
In Trinidad, one says clot. The H is quiet, a wafer of breath, just like here. There's no, tellish, there's no telling what languishes inside the body. Not mist, but a whole cloud passes into one window, then two hours out the other. My American college students try out their kindergarten Hindi. Hapital, hapital. Lips finger the sign script, and then the United States break open their mouths into sad smiles when they realize it's not Hindi, but English written in Devanagari, hospital. For the whole day, we drive along miles of wet, slithering clay to find a temple at the top of a mountain where Shiva is said to have once dropped a piece of Parvati. Every mountaintop made holy by the falling charred body part of the goddess. An elbow fell here, here fell her toe, an ankle black and burnt, her knee. The road is wet and dark red and keeps spinning. I sit behind the driver, admiring his cinnamon fingers, his quaffed white beard, his pale pink turban wrapped so handsomely. Why did it take all that? I mean, why did she have to jump into the celestial fire to prove her purity? She was cool, poisonous blue, I know, a shimmering galaxy, but when it came to his old lady man, he fucked up. Why couldn't he just believe her? I joke with the driver. We laugh. Gurumuk smiles back. But then I think, perhaps embodiment is so bewildering, even God grows wrecked with doubt. For a certain amount of rupees, the temples hired a man to announce to tourists during the medieval period, virgins were sacrificed here. His capitalist glance mirrors our orientalist tans. You're lying, I say. Save it for somebody pale. He smiles, passes me a beady. I'm bleeding but lie so I can go inside and see that burnt, charred piece of the goddess that fell off right here. We climb up another 108 stairs. At the top, I try not to listen to anyone. An entire Himalayan valley chiseled. Every mountain, peak to base, a terraced, living, verdant staircase for the goddess to walk down. Sri Bhuvaneshwari. At night, our caravan winds back over gravel and clay. Tin headlamps grope the mountain walls of the green, black valley. The road is only as wide as one small car. Hours of dog elbows, switchbacks, half roads. Slowly after a turn, the driver takes his foot off the gas, downshifts, coast. Black, warm, breath, snorting. Our car rubs against one biting grass off the face of a cliff, then another taller than our car, then hundreds block the road. Thick cylindrical horns scrape the driver's window, eyes so white black pupils gleam. Peering into our cab, grunting and drooling onto the window, now the whole car surrounded, warm black bodies covered in fur. Near their dusty hooves, children sit on the ground, nested in laps, quiet and smiling, everyone embroidered with color. Silvers, metallics, ochres, coals, golds, reds, bold blacks, all of it, and a green so green, I realize it's a shade I've never seen. A whole nomadic clan traveling with hundreds of water buffalo, at least 60 human beings. There are so many buffalo, our cars cannot move, and they can't move the herd because a few feet ahead, a she-buffalo is giving birth. We get out and wait. Out of habit, my students pull out their American sympathy, but then the driver says all the women sitting there on the ground, dusty with children in their laps, dangling their ankles over the mountain, adorned, all wear enough gold and own enough buffalo to buy your whole house cash. The night holds. Life is giving birth in the middle of a warm, dark road. Everyone in our party waits, smiling and gesturing with the whole clown, sorry, with the whole clan, surrounded by snoring black bodies taller than our chins. We squat beside their lanterns, stand inside our headlight. The driver who grew up in this valley speaks two dialects, four national languages, plus English, cannot understand a single word anyone says. Solid gold bangles, thick as bagels. 
diamonds so large and rough they look like large cubes of clear glass. The women stare through their bright syllables, then one lifts her hand, points at one of us, says something, and they all laugh. The calf is born dead, a folded and wet black nothing. It falls out of its mother still onto the ground. We watch it in the headlamps, empty fur sack, a broken umbrella made of blood and bone. The mother tries to run. Several men hold her, throw broad coils of ropes around her hooves. Two men, barefoot and dotis, grab her on each side by her horns and wait. They wait through her heaving. They sing to her. They coo. Men who are midwives. Through floor translations, they say it is her first time. She must turn around and see what has happened to her, or she will go mad. We wait with the whole tribe, wait with the whole night, wait for her to stop bucking. Her hip bones are as tall as my eyes. Her neck is a massive drum. They do not force her, but they will not let her run. She is pinned to the mountain. Her black flat tail points down toward her dead newborn. There are four hands on her wide horns. Four more hold the ropes surrounding her haunches. Finally, after an hour of bucking and grunting, she drops her eyes and gives. She lowers her face into it, into the black, slick, dead thing folded on the ground, and sniffs, nudges the body, snorts. Then they let her go. She runs off back into the snoring herd, disappears. One day, ten years later, one fine odd day, suddenly I will remember all of this. That night, that dark, narrow road will come back like a small, sleepy child. It will sit gently down inside my lap and look up into me. Coal and camphor around all the baby's eyes to keep evil away. That exquisite smell of men and sweat and dust the unanticipated calm of standing within an enormous herd of sleeping water buffalo, listening. To spend your entire life out of doors, walking the world with your whole family and neighborhood. To stay together, to leave together, what a blessing, I think, and then quickly, what a curse. My newborn is asleep in a red wagon that says radio flyer. I have packed a large suitcase and one box. The world wants to know what I am made of. I am trying to find a way to answer her. I place our things by the door and wait, standing, eyes closed, looking. I want to remember the carved angels flying over the tall bay windows, the front door's 12 perfect squares of beveled glass, the cloud-high ceilings, the baby stuffed monkey, the tribal rugs, and the photograph of our tent in the desert that one soundless morning on the floor of a canyon in Jordan, all in boxes now. The lights are on, the house is empty, night comes. I can smell the giant magnolia blossoms opening. Once I thought I was a person with a body, the body of something peering out, enchanted and tossed. The baby wakes. He is almost four weeks old. I give him a piece of my body. He fingers my necklace strung with green glass beads. I tie him onto my backs and think about the brazen dahlias nursed from seeds, staging a magenta riot now next to the rusty Victorian daybed where he was conceived beneath the happy banana tree out on the back balcony. My father's gold earrings are welded into my ears. My mother's diamonds are folded into a handkerchief inside my pocket. And then, as if it is the most natural thing to do, I walk toward the stairwell and give the world my answer. All the way down the staircase, my hand palms the mahogany rail, and I think, once this beam of wood stood high inside a great dark forest. Thick coat, black fur, two russet horns twisted to stone. One night I was stuck on a narrow road panting. I was pregnant, I was dead, I was a fetus. I was just born. Most days I don't know what I am. I am a photograph of a saint, smiling. For years my whole body ran away from me. 
When I flew charred through the air, my ankles and toes fell off onto the peaks of impassable mountains. I have to go back to that wet, black thing, dead in the road. I have to turn around. I must put my face in it. It is my first time. I wouldn't have it any other way. I am a valley of repeating verdant balconies. Thank you.